Um, and then now we're back with MI Tech TV. I took some time off that last week. Matthew was just telling me about all of his vacation fun. And so we've came back. We want to scare you in the first uh, half hour, actually. We're going to have uh, Richard Steen and on and Dan Lorman, and they're going to tell you about all those bad people out there trying to do bad things to your business and personal computers. So uh, let's take it away. Um, I don't, whichever, I, I see Richard is unmuted. Why don't you go ahead and start, Richard? All right. Yeah. Uh, well, let's talk about NIST, who, um, of course, NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Testing for the United States, and they have a big impact in the world of all standards. Um, so they finally announced that they are, uh, you know, have reviewed and accepted three different ways for post-quantum cryptography. Uh, so this is one of those rare instances where theoretically we've decided quantum computing could completely disrupt all of public key infrastructure and all the cool encryption technology we've had for mm. 50 years, just about. And because a quantum computer theoretically could solve, you know, and find the <clears throat> factors of a huge prime number in microseconds instead of the centuries that it takes if you use all of AWS, for instance, right now. So everybody's worried about it. What are we going to do in that future? So people are coming up with new algorithms that can't be cracked in that way. So that's where we're at. NIST has said, hey, there are three that we think will work. Huh. Any thoughts on that, Dan? Well, I think I think quantum computing is one of those topics that you know that's kind of leading out that um, you know Richard's right for highlighting that. I mean, I, 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 there's so many. Um, I mean, if you talk about like the top three or four, you know, leading edge, bleeding edge uh, technologies in the cyber cyber world that we live in that could really change the way we do things. We you know we keep talking about AI artificial intelligence or machine learning. I mean, we can have a whole debate about that, but that's certainly one big category. Another one is autonomous vehicles. You know, what's really going to happen with autonomy and not just vehicles, you know, drones and this and that. And yeah, the military is doing some autonomous drones and things, but are we really going to have that on our roads? And what are the, what if those car got hacked? What if, you know, all those kinds of things. And then quantum is right up there. I mean, and so you keep hearing, um, you know, that, that, it's coming that it's going to, you know, basically render cybersecurity as we know it unusable. And really across the whole range of products and services, we're going to have to redo everything in cybersecurity. So Richard's right. And, and, and there are companies coming out now claiming that they're quantum ready encryption. Um, there's different, you know, proprietary products out there. They won't tell you what their secret sauce is. Start naming companies that won't go there right now. Richard's got a great, uh, handbook for those who don't have it or uh, yearbook, I guess they call it handbook, yearbook on all those different vendors and what they do. Um, but, you know, so this, I think it's really early days. I mean, it, it, we could have a, a, a good discussion around what what's really going to happen with quantum. When is this moment going to happen that's going to, you know, is it 2025? Is it probably not 2022? Um, although there's some people that, you know, kind of say that it could be, you know, imminent. Um, I, I'm hearing more, you know, a few years out. I keep hearing a few years out with quantum computing. So, I mean, these, these algorithms are important. I think the, the question is going to be um, kind of the timeline and how this gets implemented. Well, yeah, let's, one, take a step, let's take a step back here, fellas, if I could. Um, for people who might not know, um, why don't you give us the, uh, the 12th grade level definition of what quantum computing is and how it's different from computing as it's done today, uh, basically with ones and zeros, just faster and faster and faster ones and zeros. I'll take a stab at it. Um, so if you think about it, the the digital revolution occurred when uh, we, we made um, the ability to switch, have switches so we're either on or off and that's zero or one, that thus binary, thus digital. Um, and all of computing is based on that, right? Just making a whole bunch of calculations, decisions, programming languages, machine languages, all depending on ones and zeros. That's all we have. Um, so along comes the concept of a qubit, which has more than two states. It's not just on or off. As a matter of fact, probabilistically, it's any possible state between mm -hmm. one and zero. So infinite states. 
Um, so therefore, you can store and do a lot more manipulation with just a few bits, qubits, they're called. And so far, I think, you know, you've got the IBMs, um, gosh, China, the NSA, everybody's working on it at once. And they're all trying to build machines that can use quantum computing. And it reminds me of, you know, the very, very early days before my time, obviously, when they're you know, wiring together transistors. Uh, and before that, relays. So we're just mechanical switches that were on and off. Um, and today, if you look at, uh, you know, an image of a qubit machine, um, it's giant stuff, you know, and they have to be in temperature controlled rooms because, you know, they're using lasers for the circuitry. In other words, you know, the length of a fiber optic cable uh, has to be exact because, you know, you'd be off by a trillionth of a second if the cable is too short or too long. So super complicated. But, you know, this last week we saw the very first uh, implementation of some sort of quantum calculation inside silicon, which is going to be the the leap forward, right? If we can etch it into silicon where we can actually control those distances, uh, then we could get there somehow. But right now the biggest computer has got, you know, eight bits, 16 bits. We're not, you know, this isn't like a 16 bit chip like it used to be. This means the entire computer can store 16 bits at a, at a time. Yeah, I, th I think the promise is, is immense. I mean, I, I headline here that I wrote a blog on this a few weeks back. Um, and, and, you know, talked about Washington Post wrote this, that the U.S. hatches new plan to build a quantum Internet that will be unhackable. And, and I get real scared as soon as you hear the word unhackable. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, right. it's, it's, I totally heard that unsinkable. one before. Right? Yeah, yeah right. exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. There's shades of a lot of, of movies. Right. And, you know, James Bond and, and Mission Impossible and everything else. Um, the new net would sit along our existing web, offering a more secure way to send and receive information securely. So, I mean, what I always, I guess, you know, we could spend a lot of time talking about this. Um, I'm not an expert in quantum. I would just say this, that whatever, you know, where we're going, this is cutting edge, bleeding edge technology. It is going to definitely change the world uh, dramatically. I have no question about that. But don't forget, everyone out there, it's about people, process, and technology. So, you know, inevitably, the people piece is huge. So you've got your, you know, it's not just the tech, can the technology be hacked? It's also, you know, can they infiltrate your organization, inner, insider threats, all of those kinds of things are still going to be out there. So I, I, I get a little scared when we see words like unhackable. And we already have all of the technology needed to make every single hack that we've talked about in the last four or five years impossible, right? So if only people had done what, what they need to do to make it impossible, and nobody does, and that's the vulnerability that you can't fix. Yeah, and I think every study I've ever seen shows that the bulk of the problems are internal. Now, somebody, bad people on the inside doing bad things are stupid things, like clicking on links after they've been told, don't click on links for people you don't know, or even people you do know that you're not expecting to get an email from. I mean, it's really kind of, it's the two factors. It's education, right? And it's still insiders pulling off a lot of this crap, right? Sure. Yep. Solar wind was the solar winds or colonial pipeline where it was basically a email to somebody. I on think the it was inside colonial with, pipeline. Yeah. So. Colonial pipeline email to somebody on the inside with a beautiful woman in a bikini. If you'd like to see more pictures, click here. Oh boy. <laughs> it's like, come on. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. Yeah. So, all right. So quantum computers, what else do we got out there? And you've got 20 minutes. So we got lots of time to talk about lots of things. I think oh, you want to start, Richard, and we talked no. about you know, uh, North Your Korea turn. and uh, the topic we were kicking around. It's certainly one that's really hot right now is Maui ransomware. And um, a lot of reports recently, and again, I blogged on this over the weekend. So if you want to go to govtech.com, you can read my blog. And Richard talks about these things a lot with different audiences as well. But on July 6th, CISA, which is the Cybersecurity Infrastructure um, an infrastructure security agency um, issued a, a new alert, um, and it's called AA22 187A. Good, uh, and a, you know, good, <laughs> good alert number, right? It keep, 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 keeps you on your toes. Yeah, but, real uh, basically, basically warning uh, that North Korea 
um, state-sponsored cyber actors are targeting our healthcare organizations using Maui ransomware. And I'll let Richard describe the differences with Maui ransomware, but you know, this is this has obviously gotten a lot of national attention, international attention. Um, a lot of discussions we've had on this show in the past talking about, you know, now when you're going up, if you're a hospital, you're a healthcare doctor's office, um, and you're going up nation state attack, um, it's much more sophisticated than some other uh, types of ransomware, it's, um, uh, manual inputs, a lot of um, uh, you know, hands-on kind of, of changes they made to this. Uh, I'll let Richard describe that, but that's certainly getting a lot of news and a lot of headlines in the cyber world. So Richard, you wanna describe Maui ransomware? Yeah, you just did a better job than I could of the changes in the methodology. Um, I like to focus on the changes in attackers um, yeah. because I was even writing about how, you know what, there is a chance that there, there's a threat to the cybersecurity industry. And that's if the bad guys stop being bad guys, right? If they go retire on a, on a beach in Odessa. Um, mm -hmm. And if the, you know, as you know, I think on this program, I predicted that the war in Ukraine is going to end badly for Russia. Mm. Uh, if it ends in certain scenarios in such a way that there's regime change in Russia, then the you know the new regime will want to play nice with the West. <coughs> Excuse me, and they will shut down their ransomware hackers. They'll stop you know taking whatever cut they get of all the ransomware, and all of a sudden things will be a lot better which is not good for the industry, right? Because we won't have all the news to talk about. Um, <laughs> and Dan and I won't be on your show anymore because there'll be nothing to talk about. Oh, Michael, I suspect there'll be a few things. But <laughs> oh, <yeah>. so, uh, <clears throat> so, but look at North Korea's getting in the game. Well, they've always been in the game, but this is a pretty big campaign just to steal money, right? They just need every dollar they can get, and, or Bitcoin in this case. And they're going to get that uh, because... They'll always find a healthcare organization or state and local government. Now, if, if they follow the path of the Russian uh, cybercrime guys, they are going to start looking for people with lots of money. And healthcare, frankly, doesn't have a lot of money, right? You can't ask them for $100 million. Um, <clears throat> and though they stand to lose that much if somebody leaks the personal information uh, and healthcare records, right? Because they'll be fined uh, by the uh, health and human services, I think, uh, ex exerts those fines for HIPAA violations. So, you know, it's it's just like uh, North Korea engaging in, you know, drug muling uh, through their embassies around the world. They just need money, you know, because they are starving. Quite literally. Go ahead, yep. Mr. Matt. All right. Um, what uh, what's the latest in in terms of um, state? You, you you were you were mentioning North Korea before. Uh, what what's the latest in in state actors? Um, I know last time you were on the show, uh, Richard. I think you said Russia was being kind of quiet because they're kind of preoccupied with Ukraine these days. <laughs> kind of busy still, there. Yeah. Yeah. Is is that still the case? And and what are the other state you know mischief makers doing? People like North Korea and others in Eastern Europe. Yeah, it turns out they're not, they weren't necessarily uh, curtailing their activity out of Russia. They've been waging several attacks that have now come to the fore against Ukraine. Um, so a lot like Matt Petya and the attacks on the critical infrastructure from four years ago, um, they are uh, engaged in active campaigns to hack and take down Ukraine um, you know, critical businesses. So that's going on. But the big news this past week, at least to me, is right in the middle of writing a book again on state-sponsored hacking, was that for the first time ever, the heads of the FBI and MI5 had a joint press conference to announce you know, and warn us that China is engaged in massive uh, cyber espionage. And the reason they were doing it is because it's industrial espionage. And if you have information that, especially if you're a manufacturer or in pharma, uh, pharmaceuticals, intellectual property of any sort, China's after it. So it really expands the amount of people that have to worry about these targeted attacks. Mm. Um, it well, reminded well, me of the 2005 announcement coming from MI5 uh, again, and it was, oh, it was an, a letter sent to 500 businesses, the top businesses in the UK, warning them that China was attacking them. 
<clears throat> this is three years after Titan Rain, so you know we all knew this was happening already, but it was the first public instance of the UK acknowledging China's cyber activity. Well, we certainly know China hacks the military because I've seen pictures of their latest uh, jets and things, and they have an eerie symbol uh, resemblance to American technology, isn't it? Something odd, yeah. right? Yep, yep. They're uh, just heavier. Yeah, you know, it's, which doesn't help. No. And I wanted the guys. I just wanted to jump back for a moment, real quick, to the Maui ransomware and just tell the audience that you know, we don't want to just talk about problems. We do want to talk about solutions as well. And and I really encourage you to go to the CISA alert, CISA.gov. Um, you can go and, and we'll get this out to Mike and he can he can make sure he posts it with the article out there. But but, um, you know, uh, under U.S. cert, um, it, it's again, alert AA22-187A, but they list a lot of different mitigation steps you can take. They have indicators of compromise that you can you can look at as an organization. And then they have the steps you, know, would, you can follow. I'm just going to list a couple of them real quick. But there's certainly also that we've talked about in the past, the Shields Up campaign as well. So things that people can be doing. These are really helpful um, tips and, 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 and really go further than just tips. They really have some great strategies around what you should be doing to help protect your organization. But, um, you know, a couple of them I'll just, I'll just mention that come from, this comes from FBI, CISA, and, and uh, U.S. Treasury. Um, and it lists about 10 different ones, but limits, limit access to data by deploying public key infrastructure and digital certificates to authenticate connections with the network, Internet of Things, and medical devices, and the electronic health record system, as well as ensure data packages are not manipulated in, while in transit from a man-in-the-middle attacks. That's one. Another one, use standard user account counts on internal systems instead of administrative accounts. Again, admin accounts is one of the ways they can really get, you know, get much more control over your networks. Turn off network device management interfaces such as Telnet, SSH, Winbox, and HTTP for wide area networks. Secure with strong passwords and encryption when enabled. Uh, I'm just going to give a couple more here, but this is a whole laundry list of practical, and I'm going to get into too much technical detail here, but for the audience to know these things. Um, Protect stored data by masking the permanent account number, PAN, when it is displayed and rendering it unreadable when it is stored through cryptography, for example. Uh, secure the collection, storage, and processing for PA, PII and PHI per regulation, such as the HIPAA um, Act. Um, HIPAA lays out a lot of steps people should be taking. Uh, and there's a number of other tips in here around making sure you have you know, the same ransomware things we've talked about in the past. Um, with with Matt and Mike and and and, and Richard and you know, around day, good backups, tested backups, making sure you actually know that they work and they you know you can be restored. So this is just a few of them, but there's a lot more. It's actually like a seven page um, alert, and you can go through those details at the CISA website. Or you can read any of Dan's blog posts from <laughs> 15 years ago, where he said the exact same thing. Uh, you're, you're too kind. You're too kind. There's some good stuff in here. There's some in the indicators of compromise that, that are unique to this one. But I mean, I, I, you know, there's a lot of these. You're right that a lot of these are kind of common across the ransomware families. So you certainly need to be aware. And, and but, you know, management wants to know. I know a lot of times and I was CISO in Michigan government and I worked with security mentoring. Others. Management often wants to know, you know, well, what are we doing and what, you know, what are we hearing from the feds and what steps are we taking? You know, at a minimum, this is a really great checklist to make sure you're going through these steps and you're following these. And, and many organizations probably already are, but I'm sure there are hospitals and healthcare organizations that are not doing these things. You know, which kind of brings me to a point. And, and a lot of the, the low hanging fruit are the very small organizations that have very poor IT, you know, protections. I mean, they're, they got, you know, Hilda's in the back room running the payroll but really doesn't understand, you know, all the stuff that she needs to be worried about having the, the, the system exposed to bad guys. How do we solve that problem? Oh, yeah. Richard, you come jump in. I mean, it, it, it is an age old issue. I mean, it starts with awareness and it starts with really understanding the impact. Um, I, I think more and more the awareness is getting better. People are seeing their neighbors from small businesses, medium businesses, governments, getting hit by ransomware. So more and more people are um, hearing this. I will give you one quick example. I just happened to be in New York City a couple of weeks back in June. I had an opportunity to speak to, they were mid-sized businesses, but they were building multi-million dollar houses. 
um, a group of CEOs, 100 CEOs in, in New York City. And, um, and a number of them, before I even got up, there was a panel of, all, of, of like five CEOs on current trends. And the first guy up was like, hey, you know, we got hit by ransomware. I was really looking forward to the next session to listen to him talk about ransomware. I mean, it, 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 they, it, it is hitting mid-sized businesses. It, it is hitting small businesses. The word is getting out. It's the follow through and actually it's people processing technology, like we said before, getting the, you know, getting the executive board involved, getting the senior management involved, and then making sure they're taking steps to follow through. I think the word is getting out, but Richard, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, the, the my, you know, unlike you, Dan, I don't believe that you can have any impact whatsoever by training people to be better. And yet... Okay. I'm obviously in the security awareness business myself, right? That, that's what I do. I tell people to be more secure and I tell them how to do it. Um, the great thing we have working for us is the hackers. So if you're somebody who's maybe heard us on this show say, you know, just click on that security link on Facebook and add your cell phone number so that Facebook can give you a code whenever you log in, you will never be hacked. Mm -hmm. And Nobody does it until they get hacked and they have to tell all their friends, oh, that wasn't me, you know, ignore it. Uh, I got hacked, da, da, da. And now they find out about security and educate themselves. Same thing goes all the way up to the largest organizations in the world. The reason Lockheed Martin is the best that I've ever seen at defending themselves against targeted attacks is that they had one of the biggest attacks in history when all of the the data was stolen by China for the 10 uh, most sophisticated weapon systems that the U.S. produces. Even to this day, everything for the THAAD, for the, um, you know, the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, all of it is owned by China. So those companies need to learn the same way. We all do. And if, you know, and the hackers are going to continue to teach us. So pay attention, take steps, don't be hit twice right if you get hit by ransomware don't ever ever get hit by ransomware again yeah yeah um on the on the other hand it uh, provides these people are providing a very nice living for a whole bunch of cybersecurity professionals such as yourselves right that's uh, yeah there's that too <laughs> you guys have a dark view of what we do you know we're stopping the crime <laughs> I mean, yeah. listen, come on. Oh, we can just make so much crying. money. I'm, I'm thinking like, there's a no, novel. No, 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 no. You, where... help, you help people. You're the white hats. You're the good guy. We are. <laughs> Richard, I'm thinking there's a novel in this where it's really the people that are doing the hacking are the cybersecurity companies because they want you to use their services to protect them. I, I, knew, I knew Mike was going to go there next. And that's why I, I, I got to preempt that line of this, this is a rabbit trail I'm not happy with. You know, <laughs> I mean, clearly, clearly, um, Richard's bringing up a valid point about Russia and things. I, I just, I just happen to believe, you know, if you look at the numbers over the last several years, guys, and we, we've talked about this every year, right? We talk about predictions. The numbers just keep going up. I mean, you see the congressional report last year, ransomware attacks in 21 is it, um, combined more than the previous 10 years combined. I mean, huge, huge growth. I, I don't think cybercrime is going down. I, I just I, I do not see that happening in my lifetime. I mean, I just think it's getting ratcheted up and, and there are more organizations, organized crime, others getting involved that find it's, it's easier to do cybercrime than it is a lot of other type of criminal activity. With the caveat that if the rogue nations of the world, including Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, um, got their act together, and wanted to become liberal democracies, then they'd start playing nice with everybody else. And it'd be much harder to run a criminal ring because everybody would work together to shut them down. Uh -huh. I would agree with that. But I, I, I just think, you know, there's enough, <laughs> there's enough, rogue, not just rogue nations, but again, I, you know, I, I don't, we don't probably want to go down this road today, but, you know, is China a rogue nation? I mean, you know, you know, 1.2 billion people. I mean, maybe it's 1.4 now. I mean, I, I, there's there's going to be cybercrime, so it's not going away. That's my view. Well, the other issue is, as you know, goes back to the book that Richard and I wrote ten years ago. It's just <laughs> lucrative to be a bad guy in the cyber world because you make a heck of a lot of money, right? You know, so somebody just made a hundred million dollars stealing Bitcoin. Um, we saw it just this week. So yeah, a lot okay. of money. 
and and the way it goes now, they can get away with it, especially if they're in Russia, because the Russian government looks the other way. But I'm sure if they get a piece of the action. Right. I mean, come on. Right, but I mean, right. uh, it's a heck of a way to make a living. So come on. It's Bitcoin. That's funny money. It's a victimless crime. Yeah, right. No, tell you, tell I, you so, so, so quick question for you, Richard, is the fact that Bitcoin has gone from 69,000 to 20,000 and maybe, you know, maybe going down to 10,000. Is that how does that impact the business model of the criminals? I, I think they're looking at it as an opportunity, right? They'll still ask for $3 million in Bitcoin, meaning they gotcha. get four times as many Bitcoins and <laughs> okay. they'll be able to hold on to them for a while. See if they appreciate in value, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's funny how investment opportunity. I see. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah, funny how uh, <laughs> rans ransomware is the only thing that's, you know, protected against inflation, right? Because they just ask for the same amount. Buy low, um, buy low sell high. I guess. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, like I think I'm definitely buying Bitcoin when it gets back down to eight dollars. Definitely. Oh, yeah. This time around, I'm going to ride that wave. You know, buy, about I'll 10 years 10, ago, I'll buy it at 10,000. I'll buy it when it's half what it is right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> about 10 years ago, I was looking at that when it was down around $8. And I thought, this right. isn't going to go anywhere. I know. Because it, it used so. to be eight cents. It's gone up 100 times. It's not going to go up from there. All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're this coming down the home stretch here. This is where I get let you guys do a shameless plug to promote uh, whatever you're into. I'll start with Richard because I already know what he's going to promote, but go ahead. Do you have that book handy? You can wave it at the you, audience you here. might not know. Okay, I'll promote the book that is currently available. Ah. Scared of your book, 2022. Okay. If you want to learn the entire history of the industry, this is it. So it's not a history of cyber attacks. I've written plenty of books about that. This is a history of the actual pioneers that have built the industry that Dan and I are part of. And, and that then, costs uh, what that costs how much and where do they get their hands on it? Go to it-harvest.com, then you know, shop, find the shopping site. And it's fifty-four dollars. I knew it was got, right around there. Okay. Yeah, it's got a lot of data in it. And then I've uh, recently launched a app that allows you to look at my data. It's the same app I use to create the directory in the back of the book. Wow. Um, and now I've got subscribers who log in and use it every single day for their research. Wow. Is that you charge for the app or is that a freebie or what? Yeah, the app is uh, very expensive. So $12,000 a year. Wow. It's kind of like the Bloomberg terminal for uh, cybersecurity, right? There you go. Exactly. Oh, exactly. got it. Okay. And and Mr. Presidio, uh, what, what, uh, why don't you tell folks how they can reach out to Dan, by the way, is the former CISO and CIO at the state of Michigan way back when. Uh, and uh, he's been uh, working in private sector now for 10 years, close to 10, right? Yeah, it almost. Well, I left uh, left Michigan government in 2014. So, oh, okay. Yeah. More like eight years. Eight years ago, end of July, I, I left state government. So August 1st, 14, I left. Yeah, I'm, I'm with uh, Presidio, which is a digital, a global digital services and solutions provider. Um, and we do cybersecurity work, a lot of cybersecurity work as well, um, helping clients uh, migrate to the cloud and do that securely um, and all kinds of other security services. Um, I was looking for a, a handy copy of my book. I was, wasn't ready yeah. for that, Mike. But Oh, uh, sorry. Book, yes, I'll work. Okay, I should have I yeah. I I had mine ready to go. But yeah. Cyber May Day and the day after. I, I've got one around um, here somewhere. Oh, it's, got in, the, one ready. So it's got, in that we, stack over there. He's ah, got okay. it in the stack. Okay. Yeah. But Cy Cyber May Day and the day after is the name of uh, the book that I co-authored with Shemaine Tan from Sydney, Australia. It's really stories around ransomware, um, public and private sector all over the world. And then what do you do before, during, and after a major cyber attack? Um, and you know, kind of tips and, and um, what people really what are, are real anxious to hear is you know, true stories of the, you know, what people did, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and uh, what happened and, and what they would do differently now. People who thought they were ready weren't, weren't ready. Um, so we interviewed CISOs and CEOs and COOs and CFOs and others. So, uh, but yeah, they can reach me, uh, reach me at gov, um, at gov CSO on Twitter and uh, LinkedIn, Dan Lorman. Happy to reach out. And then you can find Richard on LinkedIn as well, right, Richard? Yeah, you should be able to find me. 